All right. Well, let me jump in today. I want to jump into the Word today. Uh, I told somebody, um, I really uh, have a sense that in this season we need to spend more time teaching. Uh, so uh, this year you'll hear from me and others uh, who are part of our leadership team in uh, teaching modes, speaking modes, just to try to share truth, to help us uh, to be better. Today we begin this series entitled A Fit Church. And as we begin this series entitled A Fit Church, I really want to set the tone for us as it relates to what we're trying to do. Today, here's what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you about in this first message, the importance of us living one life. Can somebody say live one life? The importance of us living one life. And here's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea that in living one life, we want to make sure that we embrace authenticity. Can somebody say authenticity? I know it was a big word. Can you say it again? Authenticity. <laughs> Right? So we want to embrace authenticity. It's going to be important if we're going to live one life for us to embrace authenticity. Then we're going to talk about the importance of access. Can you say access? And then we're going to talk about the importance of understanding gaps. Can you say gaps? I know that one was easy. Wasn't it? Say it again. Gaps. All right. And then we're going to talk about the importance of consistency. Can you say consistency? Right? It's this basic idea, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Consistency, consistency. So we're going to talk about authenticity. We're going to talk about the importance of access. We're going to talk about gaps. And we're going to talk about consistency or authenticity. And the challenge will be to apply that, to embrace that, so that each of us can live one life. In an image-conscious culture such as ours, emphasis is often placed on how we are perceived in public, how we project ourselves so that others can see us in a certain light, which is why we'll take 30 selfies to make sure that we have just the right one with just the right lighting, with just the right view before we post it. Because how we are perceived publicly is important to us. We spend a lot of time working to protect and maintain and refine our image. For many, the public persona is the persona that matters the most. But the reality is who we are in private, who we are when no one is looking, is often not given as much attention as we do to our public persona. Yet who we are in private will influence and impact who we are in public. I'll let you chew on that. There were religious leaders during the time of Jesus who were masters of image management. They mastered the art of projecting a religious persona that did not accurately reflect what was taking place in their private lives or their private worlds. Jesus used a word to describe them that we often hear people in our culture using to describe Christians. Jesus called them hypocrites. Hypocrisy is a word that was used to describe an actor. It described a person who wore a mask to play a part. They wore a mask to pretend that they were something on stage that they were not. And Jesus chose this word to describe the religious leaders of his day. Listen to what he says about them as recorded in Luke chapter 12. Meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands came together so that they were trampling on one another. He began to say to his disciples first, be on guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Somebody say, that's scary. <laughs> right? Jesus warns his followers about 
hypocrisy. He calls these religious leaders out for being play actors, for portraying themselves to be one way when actuality they lived another way. Jesus taught his disciples that they should not be hypocrites. He actually says to them in Luke 12, guard against hypocrisy. To guard against, this whole notion is to guard against, to, to make sure that you are vigilant, that you are watchful, that you are mindful, to make sure that just as you do with your alarm system, that you set up systems in place so that nothing happens to cause you to fall into hypocrisy. Jesus says, have vigilance. You see, if we're going to guard against hypocrisy, it requires paying attention to our lives to make sure that we are constantly asking ourselves the question, am I living in a way that is consistent with what it means for me to be a follower of Jesus? It requires us paying attention to our lives to make sure that we are surrendering every aspect of our lives. It requires intentionality to live one life. It is developing a way of life where we strive to be privately and publicly who we say we are as followers of Jesus Christ. But can we be honest? Surrendering our whole lives to Jesus is not easy. It's not easy because of previous conditioning and present comfort. Previous conditioning, some of us have been taught directly or indirectly that our life in Jesus is separate from all other aspects of our life. We've heard, watched, or been instructed that our life in Jesus is what we do on a particular day, at a particular time, in a particular place, with particular people. Outside of that particular day, and that particular time, and that particular place, and those particular people, we can live however we want to live. We've been inadvertently taught that life in Jesus is separate from our personal life, is separate from our relational life, is separate from our financial life, is separate from our professional life, and Lord knows it's separate from our social life. Life in Jesus is separate. It's a separate from our thoughts, from our mental and our emotional health, our attitude and our actions. Life in Jesus is one area of many other areas of our lives. You see, surrendering to Jesus is hard because of our previous condition, but it's also hard because of our personal comfort. You see, surrendering my aspect of my life to Jesus may make me uncomfortable. I mean, you know, being who Jesus wants me to be means that sometimes I got to be selfless and I got to sacrifice and I have to serve. It means that I have to deal with my anger and I have to deal with my bitterness and I have to deal with my strife. All those things that are inconsistent with him, I have to deal with them. It means I have to love people that I don't like and I have to surrender to make sure that people see him and not me. It means that I need to be a good steward of that which he has entrusted to me, not just the resources, but even my body. You see, following Jesus means me moving out of my comfort zone and embracing discomfort. And can we be honest? Most of us hate being uncomfortable. I know you don't want to talk about it, but sometimes as soon as you come in here, you're like, oh, it's cold in here. Oh, it's too hot in here. Fix it. Why? Because we want the temperature set to what we want it set to. We don't care about anybody else and what they think. We want to be comfortable. And the reality is that most of us don't like being uncomfortable. But I'll share this morning that I don't believe that most of us, even though many Christians are called hypocrites, I don't believe that most of us have a hypocrisy problem. I believe that most of us have an authenticity problem. Authenticity is typically thought of in the sense of being true to yourself. But authenticity for a follower of Jesus is being true to who Jesus called us to be. You see, I don't believe that most of us are attempting to convince people that we are something that we're not. I believe that most of us simply struggle accepting who we are in Jesus. Followers of Jesus were called Christian because they lived like Jesus. 
And most of us are struggling to accept our identity as followers of Jesus, which means we should live like Jesus. But if we desire to be the best we can be for God, for ourselves, and for others, we should learn to live one life. Can I say, uh, for those who may be watching who are not followers of Christ, I do believe, I do believe, even though it's different, I do believe that if you listen to me and follow the things that I'm going to say, even if you don't choose Jesus, that these are still good things for you to do. I just wanted to say that. My intent is for those of us who are followers of Jesus to apply them with a Jesus lens. But if you don't have a Jesus lens, I still want to encourage you to listen because I still think that what I'm saying is good stuff. So if we desire to be the best we can be, if you say, I don't believe in God, if you desire just to be the best you can be for you and for others, then we can learn to live one life. For those of us who desire to be the best we can be for God and for others, we should learn to live one life. So how do we live one life? Tell somebody, access. I know. Living one life means giving Jesus total access to our whole life. So they had a graphic on the screen. I'll ask them to place it back up about separation. So it's this whole idea, if we're going to live one life, that we want to give Jesus total access. For many of us, uh, our lives are separate. Separation of the various areas of our life is how we've been living. So our relational life is one aspect. Our, our social life is one aspect. Our professional life is one aspect. All of that is totally separate. But if we're going to to live one life, then we need to integrate our lives. This idea of integration is this idea that all of them should fit together and work together under the leadership of Jesus for us to be the best version of ourselves. So my spiritual is connected under the leadership of Jesus. My career is connected under the leadership of Jesus. My financial is connected under the leadership of Jesus. All of it is connected under the leadership of Jesus, which is very opposite from all all of it being separate. It's one thing over here, one thing over here, one thing over here, one thing over here, and they're not connected under the leadership of Jesus. The goal is for us to live an integrated life where everything is surrendered under the leadership of Jesus. For those of you who utilize uh, different word processing uh, tools such as Microsoft Word or Google Docs or things of that nature, you understand within a Google Doc or within a Microsoft Word that there is a feature there that allows you to share the document. When you share the document, you get to set what permissions you want the person that you're sharing the document to have, right? So you can decide whether or not they have editing permissions, whether or not they have reviewing permissions, or whether or not they have viewing permissions. If you set it so that when you send the document to a person for them to be able to see it, and you set it so that it's only viewing, that means they can only look at the document. They can't do anything to it. All they can do is see it. If you send it and they have the opportunity to review the document, then you've now given them permission to make recommendations for changes. They can't make the changes, but they can make recommendations for the changes. Then you go look at the changes and decide whether or not you want to make the changes. But if you give them full editing rights, that means that once you send them the document, they can view the document, they can make changes to the document, and they don't need your permission to make the changes, which suggests that you trust them enough to trust whatever changes they are going to make. The problem that we're having is that many of us only give Jesus viewing rights to our lives. We say, Jesus, you can look at my life, but don't tell me nothing about my life. Then some of us, we say, Jesus, you can review my life. You might be able to suggest some changes that I need to make, but Jesus, I want to think about whether or not I want to accept the changes that you are suggesting because I don't trust you enough to allow you to make the edits and make the changes without me weighing in on it. But when you give Jesus full editing rights, you're saying, Jesus, I trust you so much that whatever changes you make in my my life, I don't even have to look it over. I don't, I don't have to review it again because I know you all good. So because I trust you, I give you editing rights. Can I ask this morning, what kind of rights have you given Jesus to your life? What kind of access have you given him to your life? Does he have the kind of access where he can make changes 
in any area without consulting us first. Jesus says of the religious leaders that they are hypocrites because they were acting. The unfortunate reality is that hypocrites spend their time and energy pretending to be what they are not instead of spending their time and energy actually becoming who they desire to be. It's the same time. It's the same energy, but it's a different focus. And I want to encourage you, instead of wasting time trying to pretend and trying to project something that you're not, can I encourage, which is the purpose of the whole calendar, that we spend our time and our energy becoming who Jesus says we can become. It's about access, but it's also about gaps. What do you mean by gaps? Living one life means asking the Holy Spirit to help us see the gaps, own the gaps, and bridge the gaps in our lives to help us see the gaps. I don't know about you going back to Word document. I do a lot of writing and typing. So if you've ever worked in a Word document, sometimes I'll, I'll write stuff and I'll type it out. And then I'll even go back and read it over. When I go back and read it over, in, in my mind it looks good. In my mind it sounds good. But I got this thing on my, my Word document called Grammarly. And even though it looks good and it sounds good to me, Grammarly will let me know, uh, that might look good, but that's wrong, brother. <laughs> I know you think you spell that right, but we underline that to let you know that if you look in every other dictionary other than the one in your head, it's wrong. See, here's the reality. I oftentimes don't see the error of my ways. I need somebody to point out to me the error of my ways. And that's what we want to do. Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, can you help me to see the things in my life that look right and sound right, but they're not right? Can you help me to see the words that I use that in my mind, because of my family context and the people I hang out with, it look right and it sound right, but it's not right when it compares to Jesus? Can you help me to be aware of within my work culture the things that I engage in that look right in comparison to everybody else, but when I compare it to Jesus, it's not right. Please help me to see the gap. Once I see the gap, then I have the opportunity to decide, will I own the gap? Once the Holy Spirit says, mm, that's it. What you just said, that was not like Jesus. Mm. The way you just said it, that was not like Jesus. Mm. What you had in your heart when you said the right thing, but in your heart you was feeling and thinking the wrong thing, that was not like Jesus. The question becomes, when the Holy Spirit highlights that, will I own it by agreeing and surrendering, or will I resist? Now, can I be honest? Most of y'all don't really know me. You see me, but you don't really know me. You don't. I'm jacked up. Love Jesus. He loves me, but jacked up, right? And maybe like you, oftentimes when the Holy Spirit shows me stuff, I won't own it. Sometimes I'm so foolish that he not only has to show it to me, but he has to highlight it and then get somebody else to tell me what he showed me and what he highlighted. Anybody else in the room like that? See, if we're going to deal with the gaps, we need the Holy Spirit to not only help us to see it, but then when we see it, we got to own it and say, Holy Spirit, you're right, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't have. I know, I know. I knew it when I did it, but... I thought it would feel good, so I did it anyway. <laughs> Even though it did feel good in the moment, I feel bad after the moment. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest, because sometimes sin feel good in the moment. <laughs> Am I talking to any real people? <laughs> I know y'all don't want to talk. It feel good in the moment, isn't it? Like, oh, geez, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, right? To own it, but then not just see it and own it, but then to bridge the gap. What do we mean by bridge the gap. Once we own it, acknowledge it, we want to bridge the gap and simply being able to say, okay, Holy Spirit, because I see it, I don't want to behave in that way because it's inconsistent. 
So how do I now align my behavior with my belief? I'm glad you asked. We do so by making room for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So how do I align my behavior with my belief? I want to see it, I want to own it, and I want to bridge the gap. So I want to encourage us as a part of this discipline over the month to set aside time to reflect upon our day. Set aside time to reflect upon how did I do today? How did I talk to people today? How did I interact with people today? How was in my mood today? How did I do today? To reflect upon it and say, Holy Spirit, help me to see moments during this day. Can, can you put it on, on the screen? I'm watching everything else on the screen. Can you put it on the screen so I can see, so I can review the moments in my day and what I said and what I did and, and when I was off so I can own it? But not only own it, I want to be able to reflect. So now that I've reflected, I, I can see it clearly and, and I can acknowledge, okay, that was not in alignment with you. So I want to begin partnering in a process. So because I understand that transformation is a process of bridging the gaps between my beliefs and my behavior, then I want to ask, Holy Spirit, what caused me in my belief to behave contrary to a life that is consistent with Christ? Because my belief shapes my behavior, even when my belief is not what I think I believe. I'll say it again. My belief shapes my behavior, even when my belief is not what I think I believe. Right? Because many of us teach children, right, you shouldn't lie. You should not lie. Right? Which, which suggests that we believe that lying is wrong. Because it's an issue of integrity. And as followers of Christ, we want to operate in, in integrity, right? That's what we teach, right? But then somebody will call and the children answer the phone. And we say, tell them I'm not home. Yeah. Wait, wait. Do we believe that lying is an issue of integrity or not? Or is there another belief? that is more dominant than the belief about integrity? Is there another belief that I am more concerned about me and my comfort and my time and my tolerance, and because I'm concerned about me and my comfort and my time and my tolerance that I value me more than I value integrity, then I'll choose to tell my children, tell them I'm not at home because there was another belief at play that was more dominant. I'll push another example. Um, so we believe that Jesus teaches us, right, that we should be kind, right? Do y'all believe that? <laughs> Let me start there, right? So that's what we say, right? But then there are instances where it's like, yeah, but they started it. If they wouldn't have went there, we wouldn't have had to go there. But because they went there, we had to go there, right? Which suggests that there was another belief that is more dominant than the belief that I have that Jesus has taught me. So bridging the gap means that I have to begin to confront the other beliefs that are lies because they're inconsistent with the one who is the truth. See, Jesus, I got to defend me because I don't trust doing what you say will defend me. So I need to defend me because there's no way in the world I can just walk away. Because then it looked like they got me. And we sure don't want to do that, do we, Jesus? Right? So I got to address the inconsistencies that exist in all. Bridging the gap is about addressing the inconsistencies. And because I become aware, so I don't become aware of the inconsistencies until I pay attention to them, which is why I got to take time to reflect. So I can pay attention to the inconsistencies. And then once I see the inconsistency, then I want to bring the truth of what Jesus says to address the inconsistency. Jesus, here is how I behaved. I behaved that way because I got this other belief that was more dominant than your belief. So Jesus, can I take your belief? And I want to reinforce that in my head and in my heart. The Bible calls that the renewing of the mind. 
I want to renew my mind in your word so that what you say is more important and more valuable than what culture has said and what my family have said and what people on my job have said. I want what you say, Jesus, because you are my Lord and my master to be most dominant. It's about bridging the gaps. It's about access. It's about gaps. Finally, it's about consistency. Don't stop. Living one life means we don't stop surrendering to conformity to Christ. Remember, authenticity for a follower of Jesus is being true to who Jesus called us to be. The process of conformity is a process of maturing. John Maxwell, in his writings, has what he calls the law of intentionality. The law of intentionality simply says this, growth doesn't just happen. We don't improve by simply living. We have to be intentional about it. Now, we know this practically because we know that people don't mature just because they get older. If you are a young person in the room, can I just take a moment to tell you that just because they old don't mean they mature. We all know that, don't we? We know some old people who act like little children. You, you ain't got to nod, just wiggle your toe, just wiggle your toe. And if it's you, you can just frown. It's all good. It's all good. But we know it, right? So we know that you don't mature accidentally. It has to be intentional. And because it has to be intentional, then we need to intentionally commit to surrendering and don't give up on the process of surrendering. Don't give up on the process of surrendering to the Holy Spirit to bridge the gaps. Don't give up on the consistency. But here's the reality. Growth is scary. Isn't it? You start to grow, it's scary. You, I mean, you become someone you've never been before. People know how to deal with you now, but they don't know how to deal with a mature version of you. Right? Like, wait, wait, you used to cuss me out. You didn't cuss me out. Is everything okay? They don't know what's coming next. Like, are you going to run me over with a car or are we good? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know, right? When you start growing and maturing, people don't know how to deal with you. When you start responding like Christ, they, they don't know how, how to interact with you. They, they don't know what's going on. So growth is scary, right? Growth is scary because sometimes we feel in the midst of the growth we might fail. Growth is scary because sometimes, man, we're concerned about the unknown. It's scary because we wonder what others will think and what they will do. Growth is scary because we wonder as we grow and mature, who will we alienate? What people will not stick around because we've grown and matured? Because we've become more like Christ, what people will decide, well, you're trying to be too holy now. I don't want to, I can't get out with you because you're trying to be, now I'm just trying to be me in the best way I can for the glory of Christ. That's all I'm trying to do, right? So since we can't escape the fear, we have to make sure that fear is not greater than our faith. And we make sure that fear is not greater than our faith by having confidence in the God who promises that he will conform us to the image of his son. And we do this by saying, as Paul said in Philippians 1 and 6, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in me will complete the work. Yes. See, it's the confidence that, that God who sent his son to die for me and sent his son to rise for me and allowed his son to ascend and is seated at the right hand for me, who is coming back one day for me, that that same God who holds the world together, that same God will work in me and cause me to be more like Jesus. I am confident in this, that as I surrender to him, I will become all that he says I shall become. That's how we live one life. Come on, let's thank God for his word. So, Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the reminder of the importance of authenticity. We thank you for, God, the clarity about access the importance of dealing with the gaps. 
the reminder that we need to be consistent because it doesn't just happen. Help us this week to be consistent, to consistently surrender ourselves to you and trust that the God who started a work in us will complete the work that he started. We may have some bumps along the way, but you'll complete the work. We'll fail, but we can get back up again and trust that you'll complete the work. So bless now your people, God. Help us to trust that you will complete the work as we commit to not pretend, to not wear mask, but to live one life for your glory and your honor. Hear our prayer now. In Jesus' name, amen.